for joining us. We are at the Sherry Theater in North Hollywood. I am with the infamous, world famous <laughs> Micah Cola and Cover. I'm sorry. I'm not a soda. But Micah that, Cover. The, the, I like that Micah Cola though. <laughs> I like that. I should um, have my own line of soda. That's oh yeah, good. that would be amazing. Make the soda trick disappear. Yeah. I've actually seen this one soda trick where you can balance it on the side if you put just enough in it. I've seen that. Anyways, yeah, yeah. It's, it's trippy. <laughs> I've seen. Yeah, that's weird. Um, so I just wanted to ask you a few interesting questions about uh, magic, yeah. how you got started, and um, some fun stuff in between. So um, okay. I always like to get off my interviews first by saying, uh, how did you uh, get into magic? and uh, where you grew up? First of all, I uh, got my first book when I was a kid. I got my first magic book when I was about eight years old as a birthday present for my grandfather, and I was hooked. And uh, about two decades ago, I thought, man, I'd like to get paid. So I've been doing it for money professionally for about two decades now. Uh, I grew up in more than one place, but before I came to California, I came from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I spent Raleigh. most of my life there. Yeah, man. Yeah, where are you from? Uh, Rochester, New York. Originally. Oh, Syracuse. I was born in Syracuse. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I was only there a East few Coast years. East Coast represent. Represent, <laughs> yeah. I, I was only there for a few years, but I remember all the snow, and I'm sure you Oh, yeah, snow. I remember the snow. It's yeah, crazy. oh my God, fellow New Yorker. Um, so, growing up as a uh, kid, I'm sure you were inspired by somebody, or you had to have some sort of inspiration growing up. Uh, yeah, a, a lot. Um, I was a kid during the age when television was first really starting to experiment with magic specials. Mm -hmm. So you could turn on, yeah, you might remember. Uh, you could turn on the TV and there might be a magic special that night and I would record them and just watch them to death. And of course David Blaine showed up on the scene David literally Blaine. and just changed everything. Um, he really understood how to use the camera and how to use modern technology. Um, and he just changed uh, the way we look at magic. And uh, so it was guys like him, and of course David Copperfield, anytime he's on TV. I've gotten to see David Copperfield uh, twice live, and that's something you'll never forget. But those are the guys who, some of the guys who inspired me. A lot of people are most fond of uh, the famous Houdini. Oh yeah. And a lot of people say, oh, that was the main reason that I wanted to get into magic. Sure. But a lot of people, yeah, David Blaine. My, my personal favorite is uh, Chris Angel. Oh, I yeah. Love Chris Angel's style. Every, every magician has a particular style. And yes. um, David, David is uh, fond for his interesting style, I can see. Yeah, yeah, but Chris Angel uh, also changed the game. Yeah. Uh, I've met him at the Magic Castle twice, and he was incredibly gracious to me, and I will never forget that. And uh, yeah, like you say, Chris Angel uh, changed things for us as well. So we owe a lot to him. And he's, he's kind of controversial. He has a very, uh, uh, very strong, even aggressive personality, especially on camera. Mm -hmm. But again, I've met him twice personally. He was incredibly kind to me. And uh, no one can deny that he has put uh, an undeniable mark on Magic Forever. And we owe him for that. And he's like a completely different person off camera, just like everybody else. Well, you know, that's a good point. Um, and I believe that he's been coached, like a lot of celebrities, mm -hmm. like a lot of entertainers, to present himself in a certain way on camera. Because when you meet this guy off camera, and he, he also has spearheaded this uh, literally world-changing charity organization, in part inspired by his son, uh, who has uh, suffered through uh, medical conditions. And he's changed the lives of all kinds of people. And uh, he's just a good guy. So um, another question that I have to ask, how did you come up with a multitasker? That is a brilliant. Uh, did you like, that's I very kind of you. Yes. Dude, that is so kind of you. I want to know, how did you come up with such a brilliant idea? Juggling is very, very difficult to yeah, do, yeah. especially when you're entertaining five different people it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you like that. It's like the ultimate poker game. Uh, we take a deck of cards, the spectators shuffle the cards, we separate the cards into four more or less equal groups, and then they fan the cards out like we're about to play a game of poker, and then I have to figure out who has what card, uh, one card at a, at a time, 52 times. And as you were kind enough to mention, I also, tr uh, hence the title, I attempt this while blindfolded, if I can mm -hmm. get away with it, while juggling. And it's very difficult to do. The, uh, again, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. The original concept was created by a mentalist, a guy named Barry Richardson. 
I, I can't take full credit for this. Uh, and what he did was um, he, he had the volunteers separate the cards and then he tried to figure who, out who has what. A lot of magicians, another magician I've seen, Mark Haslam, an amazing magician from England, he uses this principle and he just reads the minds of two people. Two people. Which is still pretty amazing. But Barry Richardson uh, takes it to another level, uh, separates it into four, and then I thought, well, what can I bring to the table, literally? And I was actually literally looking at the table and I saw my uh, three juggling bean bags. And I thought, well, my hands are free. Uh, why not try juggling while doing this? Why not try to uh, take it to another level? And I've been doing it ever since. And uh, it doesn't always work. It's very risky. But uh, I have this mentalist, uh, Barry Richardson, to thank for the genesis of it. Yeah. I'd like to switch gears now and um, ask you some interesting questions about paranormal activity because uh, ah, yeah. uh, haunted house calls. Yeah, um, that is interesting. Did oh. you get involved in uh, paranormal uh, magician kind of stuff? Yeah, you've done your homework. Yes, <laughs> uh, I do a show called Haunted House Calls, and about two years ago, uh, there was a theater company called Force of Nature, headed by a couple of guys, uh, Sebastian Munoz and Andy Schultz, they were kind enough to produce it for me. Uh, in North Hollywood, mm -hmm. uh, not, uh, actually, I'm sorry, Burbank, but not far from here. Okay. And um, to answer your question, it's, uh, it's a magic show and a love story where I tell the story of these two people who vanished during World War II. And every trick in the show is a chapter in the story where I literally reenact uh, a moment or a highlight, uh, yeah, a highlight in the timeline of their lives up to and including when they vanished for good, forever. So this is kind of like being a medium, right? Well, it is a little like that because, um, as you know, in seances, there's a medium mm -hmm. whose job it is to lead the group into communicating with the other side. And while I don't pretend to have actual supernatural powers, what I'm doing is similar to that. I ask the audience to come with me on this uh, narrative journey and we attempt to contact the spirits of these two people who vanished during World War II. And it's my job to make them feel like maybe we have. And uh, it's, it's a tough show to do. Again, the last time I did it was about two years ago. I'm gonna do an element of it tomorrow night for a variety um, burlesque show called Peep Show Menagerie, so I'm grateful to them. Uh, it's not easy to do, but it's a lot of fun, and thank you for asking. <laughs> so my next question, um have you ever hypnotized? Are you able to hypnotize? <laughs> That's a good question because a lot of magicians, um, they go into side um, skills, I guess, uh, uh, ancillary skills. And um, one thing they do is hypnotism because it makes sense. If you are fooling an audience, uh, a lot of magicians call it the allied arts, something that's not specifically magic but related to it. So if a magician is already fooling an audience, uh, why not... Uh, fool their minds on a more scientific level. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of magicians do go into hypnotism. I myself do not. However, uh, I do have a few effects in my repertoire that include optical illusions that are not unlike hypnotizing an audience. But it is something I've considered, and I've been hypnotized myself, and it's trippy, man. So it is possible to hypnotize you. It is okay, possible, okay, and, okay. and it is trippy. It is trippy. Um, my next question would be, what's the craziest thing that has ever happened to you in the uh, magic industry? Uh, one of my goals as a magician is to make the audience the star. Uh, so if I were doing a magic show with you, I would do my best to make you the star, to make you the magician. And it's, it's risky and it, it's uh, tricky, and I use that word intentionally, to put the power in someone else's hands, literally. But sometimes they do incredible things, um, things that take me by surprise, things that sometimes I myself can't explain. I know our viewers would be a little curious and I'll get a little personal. Do you have any tattoos? Ah, uh, uh, another excellent question. A lot of magicians like tattoos. They exactly. like their body art. Um, mine's a little faded. I don't know if you'd be able to see this, but this is just an experiment. It's something that I do with actual ink. This is not an actual tattoo. Uh, I'm, I don't have the kind of guts, but it's a two and a four. <laughs> combined to create, uh, oh, and uh, Steve uh, looks like is uh, kind enough to try to close in. And, and Steve, I apologize if you can't quite see this. But something I'm experimenting with is a two and a four combined into one symbol, two and four, and you can see it's washed off a bit. But every single day, I, wrote it, I write it on my arms. Uh, it's a symbol that's very important to me. It's kind of my tattoo, but it's not permanent. Again, I don't have that kind of cool. guts. But yeah, um, some guys actually have tattoos that are like an actual 
card. Uh, you know, and, and and you pick the card, and they literally open their shirt. Was this your that's, card? That's, and they Superman that's really it. That's cool, kind of magic. It is kind of cool. That that that's commitment, man. That is. That's commitment. But then again, there's also henna tattoos. They come off in two weeks. Yeah, that's not a bad. I I might have to. That's a good idea. I may have to look into that. Start writing on yourself. That's not. A, that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, so you are also featured in uh, Ten Thousand Ways to Die. I'd yeah. love to hear about this. That was trippy. Uh, again, it just came out of nowhere. I'm not clear how they found me, but this was, uh, for you viewers at home, you may or may not be familiar with this show. It's a hardcore show, man. Um, they talk about the history of human demise, and the, the weirder the death, the better. And they get experts to talk about how this specific person died in that crazy way. So for instance, there uh, Harry Houdini, you mentioned him earlier, mm -hmm. he died, in my opinion, under really weird circumstances. At the very least, it was a combination, it was a perfect storm of amazing bad luck. Not to mention it was on Halloween. And uh, yeah, uh, again, really weird coincidences. Like you said, it was on Halloween of all dates mm -hmm. that the most mysterious man who ever lived in, in human history dies on Halloween of all days. It was crazy. So they did an episode on Harry Houdini. Uh, a magician from the Magic Castle uh, Reenacted Harry Houdini for the purposes of the episode, but they did, you know, yeah, but they did interview me as uh, some for some historical context, and I got to talk about Houdini for a while. But then they interviewed a a, um, a doctor who described the things that were happening to Harry Houdini as he died, and then you got to see this CGI, this this. Um, reenactment of his guts as he was slowly dying and it's that that's how they rolled at uh 10,000 ways to die like you they really got you into the guts of it so to speak and uh, it was cool to, uh, to be a part of that show amazing amazing yeah. um so you've done is magic your your final frontier are you going to continue to do this this is like the one thing that you've always wanted to do right yeah man um I, i've always wanted to be a performer i okay. spent a lot of time as an actor okay that was my next question yeah yeah and uh one of the reasons why i'm familiar with this theater is be I, i've never acted on this theater but i uh, support uh local theater a lot and i've seen many productions here it's a great theater the sherry theater in north hollywood on magnolia check it out but um yeah, so I used to be an actor, uh, but the, ma the magic was the only thing paying the bills, and it really took over. But a lot of the things that I do have acting in it. Um, but yeah, this is the holy grail. This is what I want to do. Uh, between performing magic and teaching magic, this is what I do for a living. Are you left-handed or right-handed? Another good question. These are, good. These are really good questions. I know. That's uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I am right-handed, but as a magician, you You're really got to... Right, well, I'm, I wish I were ambidextrous because you could get so much more done. So a lot of magicians spend, even for obvious reasons, even more time on their, uh, what, the, what is it called, the recessive hand, the mm -hmm. non-dominant hand, yeah. because they gotta get it to catch up with the other hand. So I actually do spend a lot of time working on my left hand because my dominant hand is the right. But I'm not ambidextrous, but there are some ambidextrous magicians and they can get away with a lot. Yeah. Um, are you into astrological signs? What you're saying? Uh, <laughs> one day a girl's going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> I am a Virgo. Oh, he's a Virgo. Yeah, yeah, I was born on August 23rd, so I'm told this is on the cusp mm -hmm. of Leo and Virgo. Those are the special ones that they're born on the cusp of a right. sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, a lot of magicians, I, I should know more about it, not because um, whether or not I believe in it is not as important as being familiar with it because it is so directly related to magic. Um, a lot of magicians do, uh, again, uh, the allied arts, a lot of them do fortune telling even just for entertainment. And I've done tarot card readings for entertainment and it helps to be a magician. Uh, that did make me a better tarot card reader. And being a tarot card reader did make me a better magician. So the two are closely aligned. Uh, whether you believe in it or not. <laughs> Yeah, do, do you believe in that? I I um, I'm somewhat of a fan. Um, okay. There's there's a little bit of um, tri uh, trickery to it and mm -hmm. uh, mind manipulation, but can be. Yeah. It, it can because it's it's almost like you're you're fed information that you want to hear, you know. You know that's a good point. Um, they know that uh, if they keep everything general and universal, vaguely positive, and try to stick to the things that you want to hear, it's going to make them. Uh, seem a lot more qualified, um, whether again whether it's true or not. 
Uh, and I don't mean to say, for those of you who are watching, who really believe in this stuff, I'm not trying to discount it. But you're absolutely right. Those are tools that some people can use to make their uh, readings more believable. Okay, everybody, Mike Akova, it's been a pleasure. Oh, thank the you. pleasure's thank mine, you. man. Thank, thank you. you. And, and uh, uh, I've had a blast. All right, thank you. Yeah. Take care.